In a moment, we'll hear from our US correspondent, Mark Stone, who has details of a White House briefing on the deteriorating situation in Gaza. But first this evening, a senior Hamas leader, one of the key negotiators over the fate of hostages inside Gaza, has told Sky News the militant group is committed to releasing people back to Israel. Khalid Marshall, who is now exiled in Qatar, said that would depend, though, on whether Israel stopped its airstrikes. He's spoken exclusively to our international affairs editor, Dominic Wagholm. Will you release all the civilian hostages? Will you let them go from Gaza? Unconditionally, will you let them out now? They are not hostages, first. Secondly, I told you. Whatever you call them, captives, guests, whatever, will you let them go? What have they done? I said we will release them, and the Al Qassam brigades announced that. But now they are distributed in different locations. Israel has killed more than 22 of them because of the destruction it has caused. So therefore, if Netanyahu was keen on their safety, if the Europeans and the Americans are keen on their safety, let them force Israel to stop its aggression, to stop this genocide, this brutal war crimes which are committed every day. Yesterday, only 400 victims in one night, Dominic. Let them stop this aggression and you will find the mediators like Qatar and some Arab countries like Egypt and others, they'll find a way to have them released and we'll send them to their homes. Palestinian journalists have filmed Hamas fighters going to civilian places, attacking civilians. I'm asking you, please answer. Was that intended? Was it calculated? Or was it a mistake? Did your men go too far that day? I'm telling you very specifically, the elite forces of al Qassam did not kill civilians with the admission of Israeli women in the Israeli media as a result of the fire exchange and by the bullets of the Israelis. Hamas bandanas, they're in kibbutzes, civilian places, looking for civilians. Let me finish my sentence, please. If there was any killing, this definitely was not intended, definitely. Well, we can speak to our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn now, who joins us from Doha, where he's been doing uh, that interview. The first Western television interview with that Hamas leader since the attacks. Dominic, what did you make of what he had to say? Well, Hamas Shal is a very uh, clever man. He's very articulate, and he is a kind of uh, legend within the Hamas uh, movement, the Palestinian movement. He's regarded uh, as a living martyr. He's one of the founders of Hamas. He was a, a chief of the organisation. In the mid-90s, Benjamin Netanyahu, at the time Israeli Prime Minister of Israel, sent uh, Mossad agents to assassinate him. They succeeded to get poison into his ear, uh, but Jordanian agents apprehended the Mossad agents, and King Hussein demanded the antidote to be sent from Israel, and Hala Mashal uh, was revived. So he is a very influential man with a real sort of legend and a myth around him. And what he says really uh, counts within Hamas, but also he's based here in Qatar in the political office of Hamas that was set up uh, under the blessing of the Americans uh, to be a kind of allow a diplomatic channel to be open uh, with uh, Hamas and he is one of the two senior leaders negotiating the fate of those more than 200 hostages uh, being held in Gaza. Um, he's a man who understands the power of pictures and to counter what Israel has been putting out today in recent days he came to that interview uh, with videos with photographs very graphic videos of children who've died in Gaza, one of, them, one of them of a beheaded child. He showed us very harrowing pictures. But also he knows the power of words. And he knows uh, that in this first TV interview by a man at his level in uh, Hamas to a Western uh, TV news channel, these words are very, very important. He says, if the Americans and Europeans are keen on the safety of the hostages, let them force Israel to stop its aggression. Now, that may sound like an ultimatum. But I think also it's a kind of glimmer of hope because I pressed him in that interview as to what exactly he meant by uh, Israel uh, releasing hostages, uh, sorry, Hamas releasing hostages if Israel meets the right conditions. And what he said was that Israel has to stop its random bombardments, its total destruction of Gaza. And needs to go back, he implied, to the more precision-guided attacks it's carried out on Gazan buildings uh, and targets in the past. So there's a possibility there, I think, that if Israel relents and eases off on its air offensive, more hostages may be allowed out. And I think he chose the moment to give this interview because he is trying to pressure the allies of Israel to hold off on the ground offensive and to buy time 
while the fate of those hostages is negotiated. And it's here in Qatar where their fate is being discussed. He's negotiating with other Hamas leaders via the Qataris, with the Israelis, but also the Americans and other nations holding these, uh, uh, who, who, whose hostages, uh, whose nationals are the hostages uh, in Israel. And the negotiations here are really crucial uh, to their fate, and I think we'll hear more about them in coming days. Thank you, Dominic. Dominic Waghorn, uh, they're speaking to us from Doha. Well, back here in the UK, in a statement to the House of Commons, the Prime Minister announced he was doubling the amount of aid the UK would send to Gaza. And significantly, he also announced that British intelligence was finally ready to give its verdict on who was responsible for that strike on the Al Ali hospital in Gaza. The UK government's view, he said, was that the missile likely came from within Gaza. On the basis of the deep knowledge and analysis of our intelligence and weapons experts, the British government judges that the explosion was likely caused by a missile or part of one that was launched from within Gaza towards Israel. The misreporting of this incident had a negative effect in the region, including on a vital US diplomatic effort and on tensions here at home. We need to learn the lessons and ensure that in future there is no rush to judgment. Well, our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, is here. Um, good to have you here, Sam. Many people will say, look, Rishi Sunak, we knew he was going to say that. It's no surprise. But it still felt like quite a big moment when he stood up in the Commons and he said, look, finally, this is what British intelligence is saying about that strike on the hospital. This is the British Prime Minister choosing to make a big and formal moment of what's in his attribution, basically, uh, assigning blame. It's really interesting that he did this five days after the American president, Joe Biden, basically pointed to it coming from within Gaza, that, um, uh, that, uh, uh, that attack. Uh, and um, instead, the British approach has been different. And I think it's been different for a, a couple of reasons. First of all, there is a desire to do this thoroughly, but there's also a desire to be seen to take time and to do these things thoroughly. Because as he referenced, there was a jump to try and blame Israel very early on uh, for what happened, uh, including uh, on uh, uh, by some broadcasters. Uh, and I think that what the Prime Minister wants to do is to discourage people from doing that again, which is why there was a very deliberate attempt to uh, position this and present this uh, formally a few days uh, later in order to discourage people from doing that again. It was quite an important statement, I thought, from the Prime Minister today. He did a couple of other things. He also, surprisingly, talked up the need for the two-state solution uh, for Israel and the Palestinians. Now, I have to be honest, uh, Sophie, we're a very, very long way away from that looking possible. What I do know is that at the top of the diplomatic service, they have no idea how this conflict, likely to last for months, uh, could resolve itself. So uh, Rishi Sunak there uh, sort of planting a diplomatic flag where he thinks the uh, answer should be. And he also had to answer questions about whether or not the law here in Britain should be tightened when it comes to protesters. He basically signalled he thought the law as it was uh, was in the right place uh, 24 hours after the Home Secretary's team uh, indicated she thinks there might need to be changes so that the police can arrest more people. Keir Starmer uh, also urging the Prime Minister to look to see whether there are any gaps in the law. Keir Starmer himself today... Um, again, having to uh, emphasise uh, a slightly different element of uh, his response uh, to last week. Listen to this and you see uh, uh, just how much the Labour leader's language has moved on the subject of what's going on in Israel and with Hamas. This operation can and must be done within international law. Mm. We democracies know that all human life is equal. Innocent lives must be protected. These are the principles that differentiate us from the terrorists who target Israel. So there must now be clear humanitarian corridors within Gaza for those escaping violence. Civilians must not be targeted. And where Palestinians are forced to flee, they must not be permanently displaced from their homes. International law is clear. And Sam, it's, you're right, there is a, a difference of emphasis, isn't there? It, does it feel like Keir Starmer's been perhaps coming under pressure from some on the left? Uh, I think there's an element of that. Look, just over three weeks ago, when Israel was attacked by the Hamas terrorists, uh, I think Keir Starmer initially wanted to show unconditional support for Israel. 
because of the nature of the uh, scenes that we were, we were hearing about and wanted to send a message to the Labour Party, which perhaps in the past might have acted very differently. But some of the way in which he engaged on this subject has come back to haunt him. He did say in one interview on LBC that he thought that Israel does have the right to, for instance, deny water supplies uh, to people in Gaza. And although he later in that interview referenced international law, a lot of uh, people, a lot of Labour supporters, a lot of Labour Muslim supporters uh, actually took um, uh, offence and were upset by that interview. And I've been talking today to figures within the Labour Party who said that there's a lot of work now uh, to try and uh, calm down some of the tensions in the Muslim community who, who, who feel that uh, Labour allowed itself to get in the wrong place, not fully respecting international law uh, at the start of that conflict. One person I spoke to uh, said that they, this is going to take a considerable amount of time to lower uh, the uh, temperature place at Lancashire around Birmingham. Uh, MPs and uh, different communities very worried about where Labour appeared to be uh, a, a few days ago. Um, look at this front bencher. It's Jess Phillips, well-known front bencher, uh, Birmingham uh, MP. Uh, look how she talks about uh, the issue right uh, earlier today in the Commons. What happens if international law is not followed? Can the Prime Minister give some assurance to the country and certainly to people in my constituency that if Israel breaches international law in their endeavours to defend themselves, that he will stand at that dispatch box and say so. It's quite interesting, Jess Phillips um, there uh, asking for what happens if Israel breaks international law. There were Tories doing that too. Vicky Ford asked the Prime Minister how breaches of international law, potential breaches, would be monitored, and if Israel did breach international law uh, by collectively punishing Gaza, how that country would be held to account. Rishi Sunak replied uh, that he was reassured by the conversations on his trip and uh, that they intend to follow international law. But this is an issue that you're hearing an increasing number of voices about on both sides of the aisle. OK, Sam, thank you very much indeed. Sam Coates, our Deputy Political Editor there. Now, the war in the Middle East and all of the anger and the grief is having a very real effect on community relations here in the United Kingdom. At a pro-Palestinian rally in London this week, marchers could be heard chanting for jihad against Israel. Now, the chants, of course, were widely condemned, but the people chanting weren't arrested. Now, that led the Home Secretary to call on the Metropolitan Police to use the full force of the law against them. But the police then said that specialist counter-terrorism officers hadn't identified any offences under the law and Downing Street says the existing laws won't be toughened. So, where does that leave policing the limits of free speech? Our crime correspondent Martin Brunt reports. The chant that seemed to crystallise the debate, jihad, a word that means different things to different people, from struggle to holy war. For some government ministers, it was a step too far. To the police, it wasn't a crime. After a meeting with the Home Secretary, Britain's top cop didn't appear to have changed his view. I was explaining how we are absolutely ruthless in tackling anybody who puts their foot over the legal line. We're accountable for law. We can't enforce taste or decency, but we can enforce the law. It was the law that needed changing, he said. The law that we've designed around hate crime and terrorism over recent decades hasn't taken full account of the ability of extremist groups to steer around those laws and propagate some pretty toxic messages through social media. And those lines probably need redrawing. It's a really difficult thing to do. It wasn't clear if new laws on extremists were being considered. No word from the Home Office but the Prime Minister's official spokesperson said police already had extensive powers. Will be free. If anything was needed, they said, it was clarity on how to use those powers. To learn the lessons and ensure that... Rishi Sunak spoke in the Commons. Calls for jihad on our streets are not only a threat to the Jewish community, but to our democratic values. And we expect the police to take all necessary action to tackle extremism head on. The commissioner said these were unprecedented times. Hostile state actions, 500 ongoing Islamist terror plots, and now a huge rise in hate crime. A 13-fold increase in anti-Semitic attacks, he said, and three times as many Islamophobic incidents. 
New laws on demonstrators were brought in last year. They were condemned then by civil rights campaigners who fear more restrictions on public protest. My concern is that the way in which the law has been um, reformed is um, having massive incursions on people's right to freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. Free this tube train driver's message to his passengers is unlikely to get him arrested, but he might lose his job. He's been suspended. Martin Brunt, Sky News. Well, let's pick up now, shall we, with the former Attorney General Dominic Grieve and the columnist and former speechwriter to Tony Blair, Phil Collins. Thank you both for okay. being here this evening. I think there'll be lots of people who will be watching some of the scenes from that protest and thinking, why on earth when these people arrested? There were dozens of police all over the place, and if the law doesn't allow it, then the law should be changed. What would you say to that? Clearly, the background to this demonstration was started with a, an attack by what looks like a depraved terrorist group with a, with a death cult mm. wish on, on Israeli citizens. So that's the context, but if you actually look at the demonstration itself, it was a demonstration in favour of Palestine and Palestinians. The Prime Minister himself has said he believes in a two-state solution. So there wasn't anything overtly there which was supporting Hamas or its activities. And as the point's been made, the use of the word jihad has numerous meanings and on its own means struggle of a personal character. So, but it can also mean, and is often used, to mean a sort of holy war. Which some people will be saying, look, that's... Uh, that's you, but, know, you can see why... But it's why all about a... context. And, and how are you going to persuade a judge, or for that matter, a jury? And I actually don't think a case would get beyond half-time. I went to a... You know, the defendant will say, I went to a demonstration in support of Palestinians who are uh, in a very difficult way and in support of Palestine as a concept, which the UK government says... Is, is a perfectly legitimate one. And in the course of it, I say, I believe we should struggle to achieve those things. Now, this may be mealy-mouthed by the people doing it. Uh, indeed, some of them may be secret supporters of the worst kind of terrorism. But you, to prosecute, you need to have something on which you can attach and show that somebody is actually inciting or glorifying terrorism. And the irony is that we're in a situation where the law is already cast very wide. Glorification of terrorism, as was pointed out when it was introduced by the Labour government, is so extensive that you could actually arrest an Irish Taoiseach coming back from uh, commemorating the Easter Rising in 1916. Um, the law may well be bad. The comments about social media from um, uh, the, the Chief Commissioner... Uh, uh, I think, need to be examined carefully. I wasn't clear what he was going on about. But I have to say, looking at it from my point of view and with, with a experience of this, I'm actually a bit bemused about what changes to the law can be introduced which don't, in fact, close down legitimate free speech. And perhaps at the end of the day, we should be more worried if people are thinking that terrorism is legitimate than if they're going out and expressing themselves angrily. Uh, as a society, we should be very troubled about people who legitimise violence in that fashion. But public expressions of, uh, 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 with which you may profoundly disagree, democracies have to be resilient. So I'm perfectly prepared to listen, but I must say I don't at the moment see what more can be done. I, I agree with that. I remember, I mean, the, the terrorist laws have been used to try and take people out of Labour Party conference for making an entirely peaceful remark. I remember all of the drafting of terrorist laws involved complexities and unintended consequences that it's really hard to capture at the time of drafting. So, of course, you run the risk that there are within the fold people who are, say, who are saying and thinking noxious things, but we have to protect the free speech. And it's very, very difficult, it as is... Dominic says, to capture that. It is difficult, isn't it? Because, and, and I completely take your point about, you know, what would this look like in a court of law, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, you know, some you know, Jewish viewers tonight might be thinking, I don't feel safe in London. I don't, my children don't feel safe going to school. We have thousands of people talking about jihad. What would you say to...? to... Well, the, the, I mean, I, I'm sure they would, and, and obviously you take that very seriously. The law does exist to prevent mm -hmm. uh, incursions into people's safety. So if there are attempts upon people's persons, and obviously that falls foul of a different set of laws. There's no 
perfect um, line we can draw here. And it's not that I think we're saying we wouldn't, if we could click our fingers and make it perfect, we wouldn't do so. It's just that I can't quite see the, the way of improving the law such that you could draft it and capture those people you wanted to capture, but not capture lots of others. I mean, I feel like we've had quite a lot of rhetoric from the Home Office on this, from Suella Braverman. I don't know if you would uh, agree with the sort of assessment. Um, and yet, actually, it doesn't, hasn't really come to much. Well, it is interesting that the Prime Minister has indicated he doesn't think that changes to the law are needed. And, and as I say, if you're going to change the law, it's got to have some constructive purpose and doesn't have a negative downside. I do think government should be careful about a sort of strident rhetoric, particularly when, in fact, it turns out they're not going to deliver on it. And as I say, in, in this dreadful conflict, leaving aside for one moment the terrorist violence, which is unforgivable uh, and has, can have no conceivable justification, we are dealing with an extraordinarily complicated and long-running chapter of aggression and hostility within Israel and, and, and Palestine and, and the, with the Palestinians that is bound to polarise opinion. And, and as a democracy, we have to be able to encompass those differences of view and facilitate debate and at the same time make sure that people feel safe. Yes, I entirely understand that within the Jewish community in Britain, people will feel very unsafe because there is a history, and there's no doubt about that either, of anti-Semitism, which is completely without justification. And there is also a history of violence, daubing graffiti on the outside of synagogues and, and Jewish centres, all of which is criminal and should be dealt with. Um, I am going to stop you there because we do have a bit of breaking news that we can bring you now, because Hamas have said that they have released two further hostages, two further hostages Hamas have said they've released. In the statement, they've said Nurit Yitzhak and Yochved Lifshitz will be released. Uh, they say we have decided to release them for compelling humanitarian and satisfactory reasons, despite the occupation's perpetration for more than eight violations of the procedures that were agreed upon with the Mediator Brothers that the occupation would adhere to during this day to complete the handover process. Now, that statement from Hamas, who said they are now ready to release two female detainees tomorrow via the same procedures by which the two American detainees were released yesterday. Uh, that statement there from Hamas. Uh, we will be talking uh, about this story to our US correspondent Mark Stone uh, after this break. Coming up on the Politics Hub. Yeah, I can imagine it's very You can ask me what I think. Please don't, because... No, no, I, I, look, it's very upsetting, I know. I... We've got your Sunday mornings covered. From the front page and the sounds of the streets to the voices of the people who make the major calls and big picture politics beyond Westminster. We'll put you at the heart of our story. A new start to Sunday. I'm ready. Are you? Join me, Trevor Phillips, Sunday mornings on Sky News.
five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Hello, welcome back to the Politics Hub, where we've just brought you the news that Hamas have said that two further hostages will be released. We can speak now to our US correspondent, Mark Stone, who's in Washington for us uh, in the last hour. He's had a briefing from the White House. But, Mark, I just want to talk to you first uh, about uh, the latest news that Hamas are planning to release two further hostages. What more do we know? Yeah, in fact, Sophie, just as we're speaking, uh, somebody has just messaged me um, uh, from the Qatari side who are absolutely key to all of this. Of course, Qatar has um, a, a direct line of communications uh, with Hamas. Indeed, some senior Hamas uh, officials are based not in uh, Gaza, but uh, in um, Qatar, in Doha itself. Uh, and it has now been confirmed uh, that two Israeli hostages um, have been released, I'm being told. Now, this is obviously a moving story, so that may not be entirely correct, but certainly in the process of being released, I think we can say, uh, following Qatari and Egyptian uh, mediation e efforts. So whether or not they have already been handed over or whether that is to come, your reporting was that it would be tomorrow. Uh, well, we will see, but this is certainly very um, positive news. The suggestion is uh, that they are two Israeli civilians uh, and that they will be handed over in the same way uh, that the mother and daughter uh, were handed over late last week, passed from Hamas uh, to the uh, Red Crescent, uh, who are uh, doing what they can to operate within Gaza, uh, and then from the Red Crescent taken to the border with Israel uh, and handed over uh, to officers from the Israeli Defence Forces. So this is um, breaking as we're speaking. It's something that the um, officials in the White House uh, were not asked about because it had not broken at that uh, a few, just a few minutes ago. But more broadly, uh, on, on hostages being held in Gaza, uh, they, say, they seem to suggest that, that it is the most important thing as far as they're concerned. Try trying to, to mediate, to work out how to get uh, these 200 or so hostages um, out. Uh, and we did ask, uh, ask about uh, the words uh, from one of the Hamas senior officials to us here on Sky News, speaking to Dominic Waghorn, uh, who said that, that Hamas would be uh, willing um, to release all the civilian hostages uh, held in Gaza if the airstrikes, if the Israeli airstrikes were to ease up um, on Gaza. Now, that was put to John Kirby, and, and he, he said, we take everything that, that Hamas says with a pinch of, of salt. But look, Sophie, it is absolutely clear that behind the scenes, there are senior top officials from here at the White House who are in Israel, uh, presumably in Doha and Qatar as well, working alongside the Qataris, the Egyptians, and Hamas to try uh, and secure these hostages uh, release. So very positive news on that. Uh, thank you, Mark. As Mark says, uh, we are, of course, this is a live story. It's a breaking story that we're going to keep you across. Uh, you have been, of course, in this White House briefing, uh, Mark. What came out of that? Well, the other, the other key moving uh, part of all this, I think, is, is the, the ground offensive, the Israeli ground offensive, and when that is expected to happen, or if indeed uh, it will happen. Now, there have been quite a lot of suggestions over the past day or two that the Americans are putting a lot of pressure uh, on the Israelis to hold off uh, on the ground offensive for now. Now, a, a week ago, I was standing here talking to uh, John Kirby, the um, spokesperson for the National Security Council here at the White House, and he was saying to me then, look, it's entirely up to the Israelis uh, how they carry out their operations. It's up to their military. We don't question uh, how they do it. Well, that's changed in a week. Have a listen to what he said uh, today uh, about American involvement uh, in Israeli ground operations. I can tell you, uh, we have, since the beginning of the conflict, in the early hours, maintained a level of communication with our Israeli counterparts to ascertain their intentions, their strategy, their aims, to, to see what their answers are to the kinds of tough questions that any military ought to be asking before you launch any kind of a major operation. Have you thought through the branches? Have you thought through the sequels? Have you thought through the unintended consequences? Uh, what I can tell you is that, um, that there are uh, a few um, relevant military officers with experience, the kinds of experience that, uh, that, uh, that we believe uh, um, is, a, is appropriate to 
uh, the sorts of operations that, that Israel is conducting and may conduct in the future, uh, to go over there to share some perspectives from their own experience and to ask the hard questions, the same hard questions that we've been asking of our Israeli counterparts since the beginning. Okay. How many? Uh, uh, a few. I think that is interesting. That is certainly a shift uh, in the public language that the Americans are, are now using, that they have officers on the ground in Israel asking the tough questions of the Israelis. And I suppose uh, those questions simply are, what is the end game? What does victory look like? What replaces Hamas if you decide or if you achieve your aim to remove um, Hamas's war machine, uh, as the Israelis put it? What then? What does the day after look like? Like, look like? Those are the tough questions that we now know the Americans are, are, are asking. And maybe that's why uh, the Israelis have not yet pushed into Gaza with ground troops, because they don't have those answers either. Thank you very much indeed. Mark Stone there, reporting from outside the White House. Just to recap that breaking news for you this evening, a Hamas spokesperson saying they're planning to release two female hostages tomorrow on what they call humanitarian grounds, uh, Nurit and Yokfet. Uh, they say that will be done via the same procedures by which the two American hostages were released yesterday. Still to come on The Politics Hub. The government moves to try and stop a potential rebellion over no-fault evictions. Can it still woo Generation Rent and the all-important youth vote? We'll debate that.
Now, MPs debated the Renters' Reform Bill today, which, alongside other measures, included a proposal to ban no-fault evictions. In other words, stopping landlords turfing out tenants without giving them a reason. But a lot of Conservative MPs aren't happy, many of whom are landlords. They argue that it's already hard enough to get unwanted tenants out of properties. So now the levelling up Secretary Michael Gove has rode back and told backbenchers he wouldn't enact the policy until the courts have been reformed, meaning long delays. Well, our chief political correspondent, John Craig, joins us now. John, it's turned into a bit of a row, hasn't it? Not half. I mean, this is a letter that uh, Angela Rayner, Labour's deputy leader, claims is evidence of what she calls a grubby deal between Mr Gove and his backbenchers, many of whom are bitterly opposed to the bill, the uh, Renters' Reform Bill, originally promised by Theresa May back in April 2019. Now, in this letter, he says uh, that uh, I can confirm we intend to make several changes to the bill and wider policy that affects private landlords. We must ensure landlords retain their right to swiftly get their properties back where they need to. Well, how are they going to do that? He says we'll reform the courts before we abolish section 28. That is the section in this uh, in, in original legislation which allows uh, the landlords to chuck people out with no good reason according to critics. Now, the debate is going on now. Uh, a little earlier on, Angela Rayner hit out at what she called the grubby deal, uh, where Mr Gove is buying off a rebellion. He, a few moments before that, didn't hit out at his own backbenchers and those who are claiming that the bill is unconservative. The idea that abolishing Section 21 is somehow unconservative is, is, to, be, is to be absolutely nonsensical. Conservatives exist to protect the vulnerable in society, to make sure markets work and to save the taxpayer money. Today we discover, not from an announcement to the press, Parliament or public, but from a leak, that this is indeed a core, a, the core part of a grubby private deal that the Secretary of State has struck behind closed doors with his own backbenchers. So the government that broke our justice system now uses their own failure as an excuse to break their own promises. So when, when, this, when the, will this bill become law? The answer is not for a long time now. Parliament's proroguing this week. There's a new session of Parliament next month. The bill will have to come back again. Uh, but uh, the critics of the government uh, regard this as a move by Mr Gove just to kick this whole uh, proposal into the long grass and delay it because of the opposition from his own backbenches. 68 Tory MPs are private landlords and many of them have been venting their fury at the bill and opposing it so there is going to be a long battle ahead before this becomes law. We'll see if Mr Goad's uh, grubby deal actually works for him or not. Thank you, John. John Craig, they're really capturing the drama, I think, in the uh, House of Commons. Uh, Tom Darling, the campaign manager for the Renters' Reform Coalition, is here. Thank you for being with us. I mean, this feels like the definition of being kicked into the long grass. Yes. I mean, renters have been treated incredibly badly by this government. We have some polling out today which shows the Conservative vote amongst renters, one in four of whom voted Conservative... Uh, one in four Conservative voters in 2019 were private renters in free fall, and it's no wonder because uh, they've been treated so badly. We were, we were first promised reform of uh, the private rented sector and an, uh, private rented sector and an end to no-fault evictions in 2019 uh, by Theresa May's government. Uh, four years into this parliament, we had nothing. We finally got a bill on in May, uh, five month gap between second reading and uh, first reading um, because we're hearing about a, a a uh, rebellion brewing on the uh, pro-landlord Tory backbenchers. And then today there's a leak uh, where Michael Gove has written to Tory backbenchers saying um, that uh, the ban will not be implemented an an until, uh, until the court system is reformed. I mean, I guess a lot of Conservative MPs are quite unhappy with the idea. What they would say is, look, it's already really difficult for people to get rid of tenants if they, if they do want to. So this is just making that problem worse. 
Well, it's not, it's not difficult because they can issue them with something called a Section 21 notice where they can uh, uh, kick their tenant out without giving them a reason. And as a tenant, that hangs over you when you're in a property. You have no security because you've got this kind of sword of Damocles hanging over your head the whole time. And it, it, it means you can't put roots down. And you also hear story, I hear many stories at the Renters Reform Coalition of people who have uh, been subject to revenge evictions where they've asked for repairs and their landlord issues them with a notice. Can you um, give us a bit of a sense, and I've used a bit of a sense about what life is like for people renting? Because I'm always completely astonished by the cost of renting, particularly, of course, you know, around London, but in lots of places around the countries as well. Like, what, what's the kind of reality for people? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I can speak from my own experience. I'm, t I'm 27 years old. I've been in seven properties in the last seven years and uh, sort of struggled to, as I say, put down roots in a community. But I think the, the thing that's most shocking about my case is that mine really isn't that bad at all. And I would say, actually, it's probably one of the better experiences among myself. And you've had myself. seven different properties because, what, because rents keep changing, because people... Evictions. Evictions. Yeah, yeah. basically. The landlords want to sell or, or, or some section mm. 21, you don't, you don't, you're not given a reason. So I think... Uh, and I, I should stress, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky uh, uh, as well. Um, there are many, many renters, and it is those renters who will be the worst impacted, mm. who get a Section 21 notice um, and have two months to find a new place, um, or they'll be out in the cold. And it's no wonder that 100,000 people have been put at risk of homelessness since this promise was first made um, as a result of a Section 21 notice. And the fact that the government are now saying their own position is that uh, we can't, introduce this ban because the justice system is so broken. You've had four years since the election. You've been in power. You oversee the justice system. What have you been doing? That's their own position. That's their stated position. I think the real reason we saw that today was to quell the rebellion. There's been talks of this rebellion brewing. They don't want to go back on the promise just before an election because it's really unpopular. So they uh, are trying to get this bill through or at least make it seem like they're trying to pass this bill ahead of the election. OK, so do you think people is going to impact on young people voting for the Conservatives? Uh, well, I mean, if they could at least show something, uh, if they could at least show something for young people and renters that they're trying to deliver for them. But um, as uh, a rental campaigner, we know not to hold our breaths. OK, thank you very much uh, indeed. Great to have you on the programme. Uh, Tom Darling there. Well, there we go. Now, we're going to hear from our guest, Dominic Grieve and Philip Commons in just a moment on this issue. But first, I just want to have a look at the renters' protest outside Parliament earlier this evening. What do we want? Renters' rights! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Renters' rights! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Renters' rights! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Renters' rights! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Renters' rights! When do we want it? Now! Well, let's talk to Dominic and Philip again, uh, shall we? We're ahead. There, Tom, you know, laying out the issues for renters, you know, how difficult it is, how you can't put down roots. How much sort of sympathy do you have? Oh, a lot. I mean, I think the politics of this are remarkable. I mean, one of the big changes, I think, in, in a generation has been that if you're 30 now, and even if you're in full-time work, and, and actually even in professional occupation, unless you've got some help from your parents or family, you are not going to be buying a place to live. Now, that didn't used to be the case. There's a fundamental change in the political bargain that's mm. offered by the country, I think. So these problems that we've got, and we'll come on to the preposterous idea that it's the, the fault of the broken justice system that you can use as a reason for not acting, are all symptoms of a much bigger failure of housing policy, which is absolutely fundamental. And I think that if the Conservative Party never wants anybody below 30 to vote for it again, which is fine by me, by the way, but if they don't, then they just carry on as they are. What do you think about this? There's no doubt there are far more renters than there were previously. I think it's also right to say, and I think we should just look at it from the other angle, that if it becomes very difficult for a landlord to get possession, then there's no doubt in my mind there will be fewer landlords renting. We've seen this happen before. So, in a funny way, uh, Michael Gove has half a point. If indeed you have a justified reason for wanting to take back possession, uh, and uh, which is that you want to change the use or whatever it might be, if you have to wait months and months and months to get a hearing, during which in some circumstances you may end up finding that your tenant is no longer paying you rent, all these things happen, landlords are deterred from letting at all. Uh, but I agree entirely with Phil that the, the explanation 
that it's the justice system when the justice system has been starved of cash, actually not just by the Conservative government but by its predecessors, so that the delays in the justice system are the consequence of years of neglect, it doesn't come across very well. I mean, there's no chance at all that's going to be changed, is it? So if, if that's genuinely going to be used as a reason, then this bill's not going to come back because mm. there's, there's more chance of hell freezing over than the courts being sufficiently quick and uh, efficient to get things through fast enough. So it may be that this bill simply isn't coming back yet it feels in this like current that, form. It, it does it feel like like as though that's kicked, the case. Kicked into the long grass. That's so, right, it does. Yeah. Um, how much of an issue is it for the Conservatives um, if... I mean, look, young people tend to not vote Conservative anyway, but do you think that this has well, become an increasing tend. problem? The, the opinion polling evidence <laughs> suggests a catastrophic collapse in mm. the votes of the young for the Conservative Party of a kind which, I think, threatens its future. Mm. I mean, this is, this is, as a sort of former Conservative MP, I'm no longer a member of the party, this is one of the fundamental failings of Conservatism in the period of government that I have witnessed. Mm. And it's an existential threat to the party's future. So they need to wake up about this. I, I don't, of course, people's political views change as they grow, grow older. But actually, the gulf that has now developed in people under the age of 30 or 35 in a willingness to support the Conservatives is astonishing. Um, thank you. Really interesting uh, debate. Um, I do have a little bit of an update to bring you on that breaking news that two hostages will apparently be released by Hamas. Now, this is from Reuters, the news agency. They're reporting that the two hostages are both elderly Israeli women. Now, that's Nurit Yitzhak and Yochved Lichvitz, uh, apparently going to be released for what Hamas say is humanitarian reasons. Reuters reporting that they're two elderly Israeli women. We'll bring you more updates on that story as we get it. Still to